Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bullets from the Bible. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Greg. Daniel, how are you? I'm doing great. It's cold this morning. We got ice on the ground. Wow, that's the whole joint's probably shut down down there then, huh? Well, pretty much. I mean, what are you supposed to do? You can't drive on it. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> We're in Tennessee. We all got bald tires. Yeah, not not safe to go out. <laughs> We had a question from one of our viewers yesterday about where to place the rifle here. Um, how, how to determine what is right as far as where this goes. The body type is going to determine this a lot. Oh, nice. We've got an Icelandic viewer this morning. Welcome. Ah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way. I bet they're taller there than we are here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Your body type is going to determine exactly where things go up in here. So the, the main question was, is, is how do you determine where it goes? Is it supposed to go on your clavicle or is it supposed to go beneath here? Or is it supposed to go up here more kind of in this area? And there, the, the, the main issue on how to determine this is there's no right answer to this because it's gonna be very dependent upon each of your individual body types. But the way that you can find out is by using that self-diagnosing method that we have shown you in previous episodes to where the reticles movement during recoil is going to allow you to, through experimentation, find that correct place. Now, some things to consider, my clavicle sits about right here. It runs kind of from down this direction and it comes all the way down to about right here. Okay. And so if you draw a line from where your clavicle starts and you just follow it on over to your shoulder, we're kind of right here. Now, the top of my torso is up here then, right? Right back here. And there, it kind of forms this little pocket right here and from the top down you can feel there's kind of not much in there except some muscles now depending on your body type you can see like my body you know like there's a very large muscle right here and so it it is above my clavicle now i'm going to stand up so i can exaggerate this a little bit in the prone position make sure you guys can see here I'll make sure my shirt's not all bunched up. That's the thing. That's the downside about being big. And my, I'm very broad-shouldered. I'm very thick through the chest. And so this stuff can be kind of difficult to compare to a body type like Daniel, where you, you could see pretty much everything going on there with him. Um, oh, big old boy. Yeah. <laughs> my, my clavicle is right here. And if you see how I'm going to get on this rifle, my clavicle is touching about right here. So about an inch, inch and a half down from the top, my clavicle is actually touching right there. Now, where that position is, is dictated by tens of thousands of cycles of experience. That is a relationship that I have discovered. It's not one that I've decided. Every rifle is going to be just a little bit different. Obviously, where you connect on something like this with its center of gravity and its balance point is going to be different than if it was a very compact, short, lightweight rifle with a different center of, of gravity, different balance. Okay, so this, this is a relationship that's dependent upon not only the rifle that you're shooting, but your body type. Because if I tell you, well, yeah, put it right here where I put mine, that does not work for everyone. It will not work for everyone. 
And the main reason for that is we all have different body types. So that big giant muscle that's sticking up goes from my neck down to the top of my shoulders. That is well above the contact point. This right here is my clavicle, okay? And so when I get on this rifle, that clavicle is what's being hit. Obviously trying to explain this stuff, I'm zeroing in on it consciously. And so it's almost impossible for me to do it right when I do this. Yeah. Um, this, this thing is, is something that you just settle into and you can see kind of where it goes in relation to what's the rest of going on. The bottom of my clavicle is about right here. So if you draw a line between right here and here, you can see kind of where my clavicle's running. Now, as I'm sitting upright like that, it's, it's trying to show you guys what's going on. You can see how it's gonna be very difficult. It's very different in in trying to show it versus trying to feel it think of it as a discovery process think of it as something that you are intending to learn and say okay now mr rifle show me this and so as long as you've got proper tension on your rear bag not allowing that rifle to drive itself downward as a result of having loose and floppy rear support as long as you're you're having a good natural point of aim and the rifle is static not prone to disappearing downwards then it should be coming straight back into you now when you receive it if you're not square there i'm going to exaggerate again let's say i'm over here like this it is going to have a tendency to squirt out the right side it's not going to want to stay put. So if you work on the tiny little nuanced changes in elevation and horizontal axis in here, find out where it wants to be. Find out exactly the best possible position where it is deviating the least amount. And you can see that through here. When you now, Simulated recoil, you can do that to some degree, but real recoil is going to be the thing that's going to prove this the very most. I found mine. I had I was I was too low on it. I had to I had to get my shoulder up higher on it because it was it was popping up. Every, and before the class, I just thought that was natural. That you know the reticle's going to jump, but if you get behind it right, it fixes all that. But it took some experimentation to find the exact right spot. Yeah, if I, uh, if I get this rifle up high on my clavicle, and I can, you know, in the firing position, you can mount it up like that, and yeah. you, you could. You're creating the worst case scenario on that teeter-totter effect that you get. Because you've got the center of axis of where that is coming from is higher, you're going to have it try to tip and pivot on that fulcrum. Right. So that's going to cause it to come down. Whereas if you're up here toward the top, better yet, straight behind the center axis of bore, well, then it's going to have a tendency to not be able to go anywhere except straight to the rear. Yeah. Now, body type is a big deal here. Skinny shooters that just aren't very thick through the chest they tend to have a difficult time with this because they lay flat on the ground and then they've got to come up. Gotta come they've got up, to yeah. arch themselves upward to try to catch the rifle. And so it's one easy way you can tell a novice shooter from a very advanced shooter. is A very advanced shooter is going to have a very low firing position. They're going to have a tremendous amount of their body in contact with the planet. They're going to be flattened out. Their bipod's going to be low, if they can get low, obviously. I'm talking here in perfect practice on a, on a nice flat shooting area. But that low position keeps your body in contact with solid earth. And it's going to be a very stable firing position. Whereas 
skinny guys, they have a hard time with that because they got to come up to meet it. When in actuality, they should bring the rifle down to meet them. That's what needs to happen. So when they arch themselves up like that, they become wobbly and loose because the, the top part of them is kind of detached from the bottom part now. And we, are, we can move our top of our torso in relation to our hips. We can move that around quite a lot. Right. And that changes the angle. It changes the presentation, everything that happens here. And then two, because you're not straight back from recoil, you arch, arch up like this makes it easier for the recoil to push you around and have, you have a tendency to spring back as the recoil hits you. And so it's just not solid. It's not stable. Guys ask me all the time, well, doesn't that hurt your clavicle? Having it on your clavicle like that? And my body type just dictates that's where my clavicle is. And that's where the rightest possible place for me to mount this rifle is. And the very tip of this is just above my clavicle, just barely in that little kind of mushy pocket there. And they ask, well, isn't, isn't, doesn't that hurt? Well, yeah. I mean, I've, uh, one summer I, I fired a tremendous number of rounds with a 338 Lapa, and I didn't have much of a recoil pad on that rifle. And as a result of that, I have permanent calcium buildup on my, on my clavicle. And so, uh, I think it would be almost impossible for me to break this bone right here because of how strong and how seasoned it has become through a, uh, a career of shooting. And uh, heavy recoiling things, obviously, they're going to sting a little bit, but um, the mental aspect of that training is very valuable too. You can't just expect no changes and be able to improve when you've got something like that going on. So I'd get up after a firing session, 150, 250 rounds of 338. And it feel like somebody was whacking me in the clavicle with a broomstick over here. And I'd have to take a day off and shoot light recoiling stuff in order to get back to where I could do it comfortably and not be trapped in my own head and focusing on that, on that pain. Yeah. But that too is a mental discipline aspect. That is a thing where you can simply decide that you're not going to allow something like that to enter your most sacred of realms and just ignore it. And we can make that choice just like we can make any other choice. So as is often the case, the correct location for this, if you're actually adhering to the purity and the truth of the situation, it will reveal itself to you as a function of you performing the acts. I cannot tell you for, for sure, for certain, exactly where right is. This is something that you must discover and it must be with your specific rifle. Now, once you've gained enough experience, you should be able to approach nearly any rifle and have some very basic idea what right is going to be. And again, as you come into it, proof it out. Get into position, simulate a little recoil, maybe perform a couple dry fires and try to get in tune with what it's doing before it's actually time to go live. And once you've gained enough experience, you, you should be able to mount just about any rifle. I mean, Daniel, even when you were at the class at that time, yeah. I mean, just multitude of different things. There's always some different mousetrap showing up on the firing line. And the question is always in everyone's head, is it me or is it the gun? So I end up shooting just about everybody's rifle at some point. And yeah, got down behind my 40X. My, my cheek crest is higher than almost anybody. I had to get extensions for my cheek crest hardware so that it'd go up high enough. And Greg lays down behind it and shoots little bitty groups to show me that it's shooting right. So, yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I, you, you had to turn <laughs> sideways to get your eye down to the scope <laughs> because the cheek crest went that way. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can get behind almost anything if, if you know what you're doing. Once you understand these foundational elements, once you understand these principles, they can be applied to just about any rifle in existence. Now, there are some exceptions to that where, uh, like a 50 BMG, the recoil is so severe that if the recoil pad isn't correct, you, know, you may have to make some considerations for the actuality of the situation you find yourself in. Um, if you shoot the wrong rifle on your clavicle, you can seriously hurt yourself. Um, it, it can damage you, right? 
And so there, again, there is no way for me to, to say what is unequivocally right for every rifle in every situation, because it's, it's too fluid. It's far too fluid. There's too many configurations out there. But what I can tell you is that done correctly, you, you can for sure apply all of the foundational fundamental elements of how to drive these rifles properly. And it will show you, as long as you're using proper self-diagnosis methods, you will, it will reveal itself to you. You won't have to really work on searching for it too much. The key aspect is if you're paying attention to what you see through the rifle scope, then it basically cannot hide from you. Because if the reticle is going high and left, you know that it's going low and right here. Yeah. So you just stack your body up in accordance to counter that, make sure you're working with your rear support properly and make sure that you just make some fi fine little minor adjustments here. Eventually you'll find that magic place where when you press that trigger, recoil impulse starts and ends and that crosshair just sits there. Yep, Does cool. not move from the target. That's when you know you have found that holy grail. That's when you know, ah, that's where it is. It and works. so if you get that, you need to sit there and savor that for a moment. You need to evaluate and like, ah, okay. Uh, where oh, I see, yep, that's where you are. Okay, now I know. And then you can work on the continual execution of that and, and understand what it feels like and keep, keep kind of going back to that same point every time you get on a rifle. Guys, we really appreciate the Facebook, the feedback. The last few days have been answers to specific questions that have been asked. We're here on Instagram. Uh, on Greg's account, Primal Rights account. We're on Facebook on the Primal Finish account. We are on Gunhive. There's an entire thread on Gunhive with discussions on a lot of these videos that you're welcome to join and participate in. Uh, long range hunting forums, uh, sniper side forums. There, there's discussions about this almost everywhere. And uh, your specific questions that you ask will be answered in an upcoming video. Um, and, and we've dealt with those all week long. Uh, as far as the Bible goes for today, um, we've been talking about the tongue, and James goes on talking about the tongue. Uh, he uses another example that's just crazy vivid. He says, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and is set on fire by hell. You want to talk about how important a small thing is, put a match out in South Dakota. They <laughs> understand what it is. Here in Tennessee, we don't because everything's wet anyway. It's not going anywhere. Um, when I first started talking about, when I was visiting Greg one week, started talking about building a fire. He's like, no, you can't build a fire. It's like, no, you can't even have hand warmers that have fires in them. No, that's dangerous. It'll, it'll burn the entire prairie. And I didn't fully grasp that because it's not the, the area of the world that I'm from, but a very small thing, a very small spark starts a huge fire, and we understand that. You want your world to burn around you? Don't control your tongue. You want your world to burn around you? Talk negative, think negative, say negative things, and your world is going to burn around you, and there's nothing you can do about it because you've failed to control what you say. If you want your world to go in a positive direction, you say positive things. That's, that's just the way it works. And he talks about your world burning around you because of the things that you say. And, it, and it's a reality in our lives. And the vast majority of the world, their world is burning around them. And they don't know why. And it's because they're not controlling what they think and what they say. Right now, there's a tremendous amount of exactly what you're talking about going on, specifically in the shooting community. We are experiencing a shortage of components, ammunition, and products like we've not experienced in my lifetime. And we've gone through it to some smaller degrees during a few of the earlier panics. And those that have been doing this since before it was cool have been through that. So we understand what the shortages are. Um, we saw this one coming a mile away and were able to prepare for it. But a lot of people weren't as a result of them being new or as a result of them just not really thinking about it that much. Maybe it wasn't that serious of a hobby for them to begin with, and they didn't realize how much they would miss it 
until they went out to resupply with some components and couldn't get it anymore. <laughs> um, primers being a, a massive thing right now. It's just super difficult to get primers. I saw an auction on gun brokers yesterday, three cases. So that's 15,000 primers has a bid on it for $7,000. And to put it in perspective, you could buy a case of primers for 150 bucks. <laughs> so um, we're talking over 10 times, 10, 20, 30 times what these products are typically worth. And that has caused people to have a tremendous amount of anger in their saying things. You mentioned about the tongue and having, having your, your world burn around you. A lot of the forums and a lot of social media, it becomes an echo chamber and they all get together and they all spew forth this, this toxic language. And the anonymity of the internet doesn't help. People say things they wouldn't say in, in actual, in, in person, but you, you're still saying those things. You're still putting them out there. It's still affecting people. It's still affecting yourself more than you realize. That's right. The subconscious effects of what these people are saying is going to have a lasting personal effect. There's going to be an internal consequence. And on this program, we've talked about faith. We've talked about the importance of the truth. We've talked about the the reasons why we have to look for the purity, but we haven't spent a lot of time on this. Right. The aspect of your own mind, both conscious and subconscious. And if you're seen to be saying things either in text format or through your voice, that your spirit, your soul, your subconscious is not going to be okay with it will never let you off the hook for it. You will have to come to terms with that. You will reconcile that at some point. You, you must have a consequence. Those are kind of the rules of this game that we're playing. Yeah. And so it's very important for everyone to maintain perspective and not dehumanize all of the people that are on the other side of whatever it is that you feel like is offending you. Because you may not realize what master you're serving when you're speaking this vitriolic statements. You, you feel justified because you feel that you're being unjustly treated by somebody else. But you don't even realize that you're letting yourself down in a massive way. And the things that you're saying, if they're not for certain not going to hurt anyone else, then you can't say them. Now that's something I've struggled with in my personal life a lot. And only in the last few years have I really understood just how detrimental it is. If you allow yourself to drift into that kind of gray area where maybe you're not all the way wrong, but you're not really all the way right either. Those things that we say by verbalizing them we give them an enormous amount of power. It's bad enough that we think it, but by saying it either via text on a computer or just talking with someone else. Well, thinking itself has, has a lot of damage and, and we're going to talk about that some in the next couple of days by the end of the week, but thinking itself has a lot of damage, but being said, it's not only for yourself at that point, it's, it's, it's verbalized in your own ears, but it's, it's verbalized to others around you. And, and when it's on forums, it's in writing. And that, that's even more concrete. And the more concrete we make things we shouldn't have said, the more it's going to damage our world and the, and the world of others as well. And we may feel like we're justified. We may feel like it's okay to vilify the other party. Them being wrong doesn't, doesn't warrant us doing wrong. No, it doesn't. It, it never has. It never will. And right uh, now, all of the big ammunition manufacturers are getting absolutely lit up on every single source of media that they have, it, I understand why people are feeling upset about it. But the same token, the personal responsibility that you have for creating the life that you want, the rules of that state that really, there's nothing that's outside of your reach. 
There's nothing that you can't do if you want to. That includes never being without primers again for the rest of your life. And it's not the fault of a manufacturer for not producing enough. It's not the fault of these crazy scalpers that are buying this stuff and then marking it up to insane prices and selling it on auction sites. I don't condone the behavior. I wish that it didn't exist. However, there's free will that dictates these people can kind of do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting someone else. Now, it's a difficult argument whether they're hurting someone or not. But we don't have to purchase what they're selling. We can use our inner strength to say, no, I'm not going to participate in this craziness. I'm going to just put my focus elsewhere until this dies down. When it dies down, I'm then going to seize the opportunity to make sure that I never find myself in this position again. Right. You don't have to vilify anyone for that to happen. Because if you don't vilify anyone, you will grow here. Right. You, you will feel better and stronger about yourself than if you conquered someone else. Because conquering that little nasty tug to try to get over on top of someone else, if you can conquer that, you will, be, you will be more powerful. You will have accomplished something that very few people seem to be able to do. The kind of fullness and confidence that you'll gain as a result of conquering that desire to use that forked tongue to, to, to spew that vitriolic language, if you conquer that, you'll gain a power that cannot be taken away by anyone other than you. Yeah. Yep. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man and able to control his whole body. It's one of the keys to Christianity. Control your tongue. But you do that by controlling your mind. Thanks for joining Bullets from the Bible. We'll see you tomorrow.